I don't agree with that statement. I hated playing Richmond because I thought you were a bunch of wankers. Is this all there is? I never, ever want to feel like this again. You guys look so dumb. That being a big reason why you end up stepping away. Like, can you uh, add context to that? The thing that probably not a lot of people would have known at that point was, i would never forget it. it. It shaped me as a backman. So that's a, that's a breaking news story. Welcome to Backchat, everybody. Yeah, welcome to Backchat. It's been a little while and too long since we've had a genuine backman on Backchat, which is, it's on all of us here at the team. But I'm very happy to announce and privileged to have here in the house back chat, Alex Rance. How are you, mate? I'm good, good. It's good to live the brand, live the brand, get it back online, Correct. get the back in. So uh, one of the great all-time defenders joins us this week and I'm excited. Now, I know you're a little bit of a back chat fan, so I'm sure you know what's coming, just in case you don't. Uh, we ask every guest on the show the same question first up, powered by Fleet Network, of course, back chat. We ask, what's your greatest ever sporting achievement? Now, I know you've been All-Australian captain, five-time All-Australian Premiership player. You've done a lot for Richmond. Congratulations. You can play football. I want to know your greatest sporting achievement, not on the football field. So my co-host, who is no longer with us for today, playing fistball for Australia today, Dan Const, he has taken five – yeah, we can get to, we can get into fistball in a second. Right. Yeah, it's exciting for defenders, trust me. Yeah. Five for 16 in an under-12 cricket grand final. Yeah. I was state flags champion in under-9, uh, yeah. surf life-saving. Can you take us some, to some areas that isn't football? Your greatest sporting achievement? Um, greatest sporting achievement? The bowl to Turkey. Yes, great. I don't know what that means. So that's just like three strikes in a row for 10-pin bowling. So We like that. That's yeah. on the last – your last – you know, it must be the last crack. You don't. Well, it. no, it's just on like consecutive. Oh, right. So yeah, it was like it's not really that big of an achievement. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um. What else? Bowling have I, done? I haven't heard that before. Yeah. It's very nice. Um. I did this thing called a High Rocks event, which I'm not sure anyone's. Great. Right. Tell me about it. So it's uh basically a one k run, then you do like a one k ski, one k run, one k row, one k run. Is this yeah. from over? Is over this in the states, Danish yeah. or something? Oh. <laughs> I, I thought it was like Netherlands, Netherlands. Denmark, Norway type areas. Makes sense with the name of it, but yeah. Oh, I don't know where it comes from anyway, but I, I did it and it was like really hard and loved it. And it's like right up sort of, I reckon, football player, like AFL players alley because we got to run and be strong and all that kind of stuff. Yes. So did one of them in Melbourne. And so I'm, I uh, qualified sixth in the state over in Victoria for that. But yeah, the top five went to nationals, so I was spewing. But so you were trying to get to nationals for it? Yeah, I was just. So, what, how long does it go for? Uh, it only takes like an hour. Yeah, to but do. so what is it? Repeat what it is. So I can't remember all the events, but it's basically like so: one k run, one k ski erg, one k run, one k row, one k run, farmers walk, one k run, uh, sled pull, one k run, sled push, one k run. Uh, Wall ball throws, 1K run to finish, I think. There's like eight stations. So wow. It's so solid. you're keeping in good near. Trying to keep the rust away, yeah. Wow. That's impressive stuff. I like that. So sixth in the state. I'll take that on board. That's very nice. Uh, let's keep moving now. So um, uh, greatest sporting achievement, very good. What about your first car? Uh, VX Commodore White. Um, traction control off on a wet night, drifted it uh, around, a, around a, a bend and put it straight into a rock. Wrapped it around it? Well, the, the thing was, I thought I did a really good job of avoiding really big damage because I put it through two trees. So, like, I've missed the trees and I'm like, you beauty, I'm out of the woods here. And this rock just popped up out of nowhere and tore the radiator out of the front of my oh, car. Oh, spewing. Is that over here? Or, or, yeah, know. so it was over here. So, it was in, like, um, Maida Vale, Gooseberry Hill. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Western Australia too well. But, Perfect. But... Um, Managed to wobble at home, hissing and sputtering, and finally just got it. And I was like, oh, I think I might be, I might have got away with this one here. And uh, the bumper of the car was just sitting out a little bit. So I'm like, oh, just, I'll just nudge that back in. Bang, whole bumper falls off. Dad walks out. What did you do? Take me back to the spot. Like, made me relive the moment. It was hilarious. <laughs> Dead body. <laughs> yeah. He's buried like, underground. Take me back to where you crashed yeah. the car. So you're a WA boy. What's life like growing up? Uh, football heritage, of course. Your sporting family growing up. Yeah, well, my mum, my mum played um, some basketball for. Um, so I'll, I'll go back. So mum and dad got married. Uh, so dad was playing for Swan Districts here. Played in 82, 83, 84 Swan Districts Premiership. Three Pete. Yeah, three Pete. How good That's before sad. the AFL was a thing. That's sad. Um, and then he played like all the like interstate rivalry things, so state of origin stuff. And then went and played for the Bulldogs over in um, that was in the VFL. Yes. And then came back and played for West Coast. Here was the second captain of West Coast. So when yes. 
Uh, dad and mum were over in Victoria. Mum played basketball for the Melbourne Tigers team. So had a little bit of a, a sporting heritage, but um, never really played until I was like 12, like organized sport. Dad was like, just want you to enjoy your upbringing. Don't have anything structured in place. So I did like golf, triathlons, volleyball, cricket, um, athletics, everything. So Right. Yeah. There would have been some sporting achievements in there. I mean, golf, triathlon, like that's, that's that, I mean, that sounds like a, Pretty good upbringing, getting a try at all. It was, yeah, it was awesome. I, I loved it. My sister was a very good, uh, she um, was a state kayaker as well. So she won some medals for the national champs for, for kayaking as well. So, yeah, we're always just an active family. Grew up on two and a half acres. So when you got two and a half acres to ride motorbikes, climb trees, run around, run down the creek, it sort of lends itself to being okay at sport. Were you around footy clubs at all? So you don't play organized footy, but. Wait, were you around when your old man's still playing footy? No, nah, so he retired in retired slash got the ass. It's always isn't that always a funny thing Absolutely. to talk about? Don't like, worry, I was delisted. Like the <laughs> jump rest the of gun, them. jump the gun. I'm going to retire before you sack me. There's not many that retire. Like you, people retire, but you're delisted. Yeah, right? pretty much. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so dad retired slash got the ass. Um, <laughs> Uh, That's great. In 80, out, 89. Sorry, Muzz. Um, <laughs> so I was born in 89, so it was the same same year. So I, I only just watched footage of him playing, but he still had a lot of involvement at West Coast. So um, he was doing some mentoring with guys like Darren Glass and Scotty Cummings and guys like that. So mm. I was in and out of the change rooms and was yeah, a massive West Coast fan as a kid. Really? Mm. Uh, was, was there ever some part that wanted to play for a West Australian side? Massively. I really wanted to get drafted by West Coast. And so yeah. – this is when there was only 16 teams in the comp. I was at draft camp um, and had a really good under 18s year. So I was sort of, I knew I was going to fall sort of in the first round, maybe top of the second round. So I had a, I had a, a interview with all of the teams except West Coast. Is that right? And dad's like, Trevor Nisbet, you dog. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was a, uh, yeah. So they picked up uh, Chris Maston and Scott Selwood. Yep. So two pretty handy picks. You probably take them. Decent. Um, but yeah, I often think about that draft and, you know, if you could rejig the draft, it was because it was Cruiser, Cochin, Maston, Morton, Palmer, uh, Jared Grant, maybe Patrick Vespremi, Cyril the Rioli. Um, Jared Grant, the microphone. Jared Grant. Shout out. Oh, Spindle Shanks. Um, <laughs> so he, he reminded me of Olive Oil from Popeye's, like, save me, Popeye. One of the greats. Yeah. Um, so Because I, I, I think... Like my draft class probably hurt you there, mate, because we had in mind the year before you were drafted. So we're the same age. I was born in 89. Myself, key defender. Mitch Brown, key defender. Eric McKenzie, Eric McKenzie key, yeah. key defender. Yeah. So we were stacked. You dog. There's no, there's no Thanks, room man. for I you, mate. I appreciate that. I'm sorry. You, ruined my, you ruined my childhood. Hey, you're a premiership player. It's okay. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting growing up with uh, you know a father that played VFL, AFL, um, that – you know, you end up doing it, but it doesn't doesn't sound like you were destined to play AFL, although you had a lot of sporting heritage, right? Mm. No, and like, he actually probably enjoyed me playing, like watching me play volleyball more than playing football. Um, Good volleyball player? Oh, like, I'm not the tallest guy. And as a lot of people would have seen the way I played AFL, it wasn't like a high marking, like Jeremy Cameron, like Jeremy Howe type of um, player. So... Yeah, I, you you went all right. Like you went five time all Australian. Yeah, but I used to keep him on the ground. Right, so, smart. Yeah, just play to your strengths. Yeah, good. Um, but yeah, I did really enjoy volleyball. Um, and we so much so that because um, Dad worked for after he retired slash got the ass. Let's um, just say he got this. Let's say he got this. Yeah. Um, he worked for a company called Komatsu, so Earth Moving Gear. So he'd just get like these big diggers dropped off at our house just to like dig holes and push stuff around. So he dug a beach volleyball court at our house. So we had a beach volleyball court. That's unreal. So, yeah, so it was good fun. Uh, we skipped ahead a little bit, got to your draft class, but um, I spoke to you before we chatted on air here and uh, Lewis Jetta, good mate of mine, premiership team mate, was involved in his words, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong here, the greatest football side ever assembled, uh, Swan Districts, Colts. Don't know the year. Two thousand seven. You boys were stacked. Who was in that? Who was in that class? It's an unbelievable team. We we had a phenomenal team. So we had so we got twelve drafted of our starting twenty two. Swan Districts of like one team. Like most teams, like states have that. So Correct. we had Nick Natanui, Chris Yaron, Lewis Jetta, Neville Jetta, Dave Ellard, Luke Pratt, Tony Knott, myself. Um, I probably missed Clancy Pierce. Uh, Jeff, did you say Jeffy Garlett? No, yeah, so Jeff Garlett. Um, 
So that's 10. I think we had two more, which I'm, apologies for the guys that I've missed. Yeah, you didn't say it, like Lewis Jetta, wasn't there? Lewis Jetta, Neville Jetta, yeah. So I mean, Jamie Bennell, say him. Bennell, yeah. So we had we were, we were loaded. Um, that is unbelievable. Yeah, so I think we won. And the funniest part about that whole draft class was that at the start of the year, the Guildford Hotel, which burnt down a couple of years later, but then got rebuilt now, which is great. Um, they said, you know, we'll sponsor you guys, under-18s. We'll give you um, a $10 for every goal you kick for the season. We'll put it on a bar tab for you. So we were at ten grand halfway through the year, and they're like, "We've got to cut you off. That's it. We're no more." So there's all these eighteen year old boys drinking uh, Jaeger bombs and pulse uh, with pulse and all this kind of stuff. Absolutely plied. I don't think we got through the the bar tab, but we were just absolutely yeah having a great time. Would have been some seventeen year olds in the team as well. Pretty happy with the Guildford Hotel sponsorship. Just yeah, snuck them in. Just don't. Yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, poor Guildford Hotel. I don't want to lose their liquor license. No, yeah. no. Well, as you said, it did burn down and it's back again. So like that was that was Colts. You won the, you won the grand final by. Oh, over 100 points. I can't, no. Jet, Jet said it was over in the first five minutes. It was done. Cal yeah. Morton was the superstar of the Cal, uh, Claremont footy. Claremont. Matty so they had one drive. Well, Matty DeBoer played? Yeah. So yeah. He, he was in there as well, but that was about it. Yeah. But it was like, but our WA team was pretty ridiculous as well. Like, so we won everything. So we had like Paddy McGinnity, we had Daniel Rich, we had who else was there? So Chris Maston, obviously, Cale Morton, Reece Palmer. Palmer would have been that year. Yeah, yeah, like so Cale Morton won the Lark Medal. Like we yeah. just yeah, it was a fun year. Yeah, bloody oath. So you get to Richmond and you said maybe West Coast Freo would have been nice, but what's it like moving across the other side of the country? Um, well I didn't support Richmond growing up and I no. didn't know anything about them. No so one the did. first couple of functions were like really awkward. They're like, Oh, you know, how do you feel about, you know, taking Tom Hafey's number? I'm like, who is that? Oh wow. Like <laughs> they're like, oh he's just kind of like the best coach we've ever had. Could be the let you know, top five legendary AFL coach players. All yeah. Time. And I was just like, I've no clue about this history. I knew like Matthew Richardson and Wayne Campbell. Yes. Like that were the only two players I knew. Richard was still playing, right? He was, yeah. Um so it was like it was pretty weird for me going to a club that I knew really nothing about. I didn't even know the, the song. Um, I didn't know the process of it all. Like, you know, do I just go straight in? And like, I thought I was yep, going to play AFL straight away. Like I was pretty raw, like for the whole system. Yes. Because it's a different system to WA over here as well. So like with the under 18s, so Colts, Reserves tack up, League. And tack up over there. Correct. It's all connected. So it was kind of a bit weird for me. But, um, and I was a bit of a, I was a very confident kid. Yes early days and a bit of a left field thinker as well. So I come in red hot, super turbo. Like the kids that I see come in now and they're just like call on the shots from day one. I laugh at because I'm like, that was me and I just want to slap them. There's and- a famous story of you giving a bit of feedback to uh, club legend, Matthew Richardson. Yeah. First day at training effectively. So bad. Like this is so like, oh, I've got these so many stories where my toes just like curl in my shoes. I'm just like, what, what, oh, was I so doing? Much, what happened? Plan of fascia is cramping. Um, so we, we were like, it wasn't even, it was like a borderline captain's run. Like it wasn't even- Bit of lane like, kicking. Yeah, nothing much. Get and the so ball like, in hands. But there was cones out. There was cones out. So that cones designate there's a boundary to be you know met. Yeah. So anyway, he's sort of pulled up a little bit short of the line. I've noticed it once and he's done it again. I'm like, Richo, get all the way through to the line. Imagine that. Oh You've been at a club for oh. less than a month and you're telling a Hall of Famer to get through to the line. What did he, what did he say? I was lucky to still have my jaw at that what, point. What, like, did he, what was his reaction? Well, this is, the, this is my favorite story to tell because of Richo. He just copped it. And then because he is the most genuinely nice, connected guy. Mm. Like, Because everyone sees like the demonstrative person that he was on field and thinks that he must have just been like this like horrible, horrible teammate to be with. But like, he was honestly the loveliest man and like one of the best teammates that I've ever had. So he never really sprayed me about it, which was kind of weird until later on, I look back on it and I'm like, no one checked me for that. I probably should have done, like got more for that. I can imagine that would have done the round in the rooms afterwards. So like, have, have a look at this bloke one yeah. month in telling Richo to push through the cones. <laughs> and the worst part was in my first three years where well, everyone may or may not know that I was like so bad. Like in my first three years. So everyone's thinking like, who's, the, it would be different if I came in and I was like Trent Cotchin, who's yes. like gun. Like Ultimate everyone, professional. Yeah. Knows he's going to be amazing. But everyone's just like, we don't even know if this kid's going to be any good. <laughs> and he's like spraying us. What the heck? Like, Why were you bad? Like what, 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 what you say, if that's your own words, but like what made you, were you immature? Were you inexperienced? Were you too confident? What, what? I think it was just identity crisis, to be honest, like right. like a playing identity crisis. So when you go from a team where I could have been playing, like so I was playing in the midfield with Nick Nat, like right. anyone could have been playing in the like 
Right. Could have been playing in the middle. I could have been very derogative, that, derogatory <laughs> then and said, but like anyone could have been playing in the midfield with Nick Nat putting it down your throat. Like we would yes. just be on the blitz every stoppage. Like right. me, Dave Allard were just like Harlem Globetrotters, like flicking it around anywhere. <laughs> so I come in thinking like, you beauty, I'm going to be Andrew Emberley winning a Norm Smith medal out of the midfield, just like running through big bodied, like wow. Kuda Fides type. Come in like, righto boys, uh, push aside. I'm just going to come into this midfield. And they're like, no, no, no. You're going to play down back. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, because I was sort of a running defender right. as uh, like a junior and stuff, but never like lockdown key. Right. So yeah, like I could push big weights in the gym, run really fast um, and like had the physical ability, but just didn't have the brain mm. like of what I needed to do to get a game. So it took me three or four years and like Justin Lepich basically sort of just like sat me down and was just like, this is your strength. This is what you need to do to get a game. Just do this. And then we'll start to build some other things later. Say so someone you'd attribute to turnaround? Yeah, massively. Like he gave me the skills and then Ben Rutten gave me the probably leadership and connection later. If you're going to look at two guys from footy gone by as uh, mentors, Justin Lepich, Ben Rutten, I mean, two outstanding defenders. Yeah. That's, that's some luck that they're at the football club, right? Some mm. guys wouldn't have that opportunity to learn off guys like that. I often think about that with like sliding doors moments with, you know, mm. how many times have we seen those guys that just get traded to another club or choose to go to another and they win a flag straight away and you're just like, man, mm. how did they know? They couldn't have known. Like, yes. Um, and so I had an opportunity to go to Hawthorne. So when Josh Gibson, backs chat, when uh, Josh Gibson. It's just exceptional. <laughs> just take a moment to talk when, about that sort of segue. Very good. <laughs> when Josh Gibson got picked up and went to Hawthorne before the start of their run. From North Melbourne. From North Melbourne. They were in talks with me. So it was he and I to, to Hawthorne. Like met with everyone, met with the chief, met with, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, the, the chief, the big bull chief. Went to his house. It was an amazing. Nice house. Really? Um, so nice that, so they, were, they were Hawthorne trying Legitimately, to get Legitimately, yeah. And I was like, I don't even know what I am yet. And I don't even know what you see in me. So I don't know if I can add value. I sort of was just really confused as to why they wanted to pick me up. Um, mm. Cause I played some okay games, but yeah, I look at that sliding doors moment. If I had have left, maybe they wouldn't have won and gone on to build their dynasty. Maybe I wouldn't have had the career that I had because I wouldn't have met leper and truck. Mm. Like, so it was meant to be kind of thing that, Gibbo was the person that was required at that time yes. to go to Hawthorne and I was required to stay at Richmond and then build what we built later. Because that would have been 12, 11, 12, somewhere there, your mm. fourth, fifth year in the system. So you're still young, still learning mm. and you get that ability to sort of change things around. Um, Damien Hardwick came to the club 2010. Mm. Uh, what's he like coming to the club? I know he's changed significantly and you're with him at Gold Coast now. So you probably know his journey as well as anyone, but- 2010, like, is it a changing of the guard? Do things change immediately or what's that like at the club at that time? Yeah, it was It was a real change in the guard. I'm not sure whether you experienced a similar thing around that time period where we were just, the AFL was just starting to flush out those type of coaches, which sort of, they were the senior coach and they were the loudest voice in the room. Everyone do what I say. And it was kind of a very dictatorial, mm. high responsibility role to be a head coach. And then it went to be almost like a delegatory coaching style where you started to delegate and trust your generals and make sure that you're hearing everyone out and everyone has buy-in. Yes. So that was kind of the transition from Plough to Dimmer. Terry Wallace. Yeah, Terry Wallace. Um, Sorry, so just I had for listeners. Plow, yeah, just for listeners. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I love Plough. I got along with Plough really well, but it was just, just a different time period then, like to... For, um, and I had like David King, who was my backline coach, who was again, he? amazing. Yeah, backs chat. There's another back really chat. Really good. Big key kicker. Don't worry. The, be the best names and figures across AFL history play in the backline. Don't worry yeah, about that. Yeah. Always respect oh, the so backs. David King was there, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Dimmer's best trait is his adaptability. So you don't become like a generational coach, which he's become by just being, this is the game plan that's going to win it for the next 20 years because the game changes like, every half of the season, I believe. Yes. Like you've got a the way the game's played at the start of the season isn't the way the game's played at the end of the season. So um, it's sort of like half season ch changes. So he's really adaptable, really connected, big on mental performance. And so he, I guess, learnt that over his first few years and was, um, I guess, vulnerable enough to acknowledge when he wasn't right. Um, and also 
connected with the strengths of the playing group too. Like he had Jack and I who were very strong personalities, very big on sort of culture and connecting and wanted to be heard. And then Koch who was just like Superman, just like the perfect person to be the captain. Like nothing phases him, performs at a high level, big game player. Like, so we had a really good core there to be able to build on, yeah. which which sort of helped him. Similar age too, right? Like that's yep. you boys are coming through together, which helps. Yeah. Yeah. And like and to have one in each line was fantastic too. So we've got a calmer, more organized head down back in the mid and up forward. And it also helped that we'd won individual stuff before we'd won the team stuff, if that makes sense. So so Jack had already won Coleman's and all Australians. I remember Koch that already. Actually. That was good. He kicked 10, 10 on me that year. That was was that was that the G? Yeah, it was, yeah. I remember that. Did you game. play that game? Yeah. Yeah, but, no, I was playing on Jack. But I, you know, <laughs> but like as a backman you'll appreciate it. not all ten goals are on me. No, no, selfless. You would have been you been pressing up. Eric been... McKenzie started on him, kicked yeah. four in the first quarter and then Scully had to go on him. He kicks the last six on me. But Pretty good effort, <laughs> I thought. Two you goals, can't stem goals, the flow after four in the first quarter. Thank you. He was on. He was on track for sixteen. You Thank technically, you, Thank you, you saved you. the team six okay. goals. Now, true backman though. This, yep. right? So uh, yeah, but that was that was grim. I've never, I'll never forget it. It it shaped me as a backman because I was like, I never ever want to feel like this again. Like Jack turning around, applauding, applauding to the crowd, and like, he he was a very he's a showman as well. Jack, yeah. he yeah. knew what he was doing. Did you play that game? Yeah, great. So no, I actually don't. Th- I think I. Don't think I was playing that game because I was too young or still crap at that, at that point. So I was watching the game or injured or something. But didn't Mark Lacroix kick like twelve or something that game? Or not like- not that game, but that around that time probably would have been the next year because we we were wooden spoon that year, I think, and then we played in a prelim the following year. So it probably would have been the next year we actually mm. could actually half play. Yeah, went from nothing to something. Yeah, uh, off the back of the back line, no doubt. So that was around two thousand and ten. If I can jump back in, Dusty Martin comes to the footy club the same year. And clearly, he's been a, uh, a, you know, last decade and a half, him, Buddy, maybe Games. a few other names in there, the greatest of all time. Does he come to the footy club and you know he's going to be great? From training session one. Is that right? Minute two. Why? Like, supreme confidence in a bit. So, I talk about why I was crap early and then I compare that to why Dusty was amazing early. Just supreme confidence in identity. He was just this strong bull that was like fending off everyone in this stoppage drill. And everyone's just like, what is this kid going to be? Like, no one's going to be able to touch him. Right. Um, and we're like, I think we've got a pretty good steal here at pick three. Because <laughs> he like, was pick three. Yeah. So it was Scully, Trengrove, Martin. Hmm. So Melbourne, bang, bang. Dusty's the best of those three. And that's no disrespect to the other two. Yeah. Dusty's Which, a generational talent. Yeah. So, but it's just interesting to know that as he walks in the door because you don't. Ha- that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And I think there's also something to be said for like simplicity of identity too. Like I'm a pretty, I reckon- Complex. Complex. Oh, good word. I was going to say exactly the We're same thing. We're on the thing. same page, yes. Mate, we're going to be playing really well today, I reckon, <laughs> together. We're just going to be left and right hand. We're going to touch on that. We're playing yeah. football on the same team. I'm going to go forward, which is disappointing, I know. But we can't have us both in the back line. Keep going about you being complex, Dusty being simple. So, and 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 don't- I don't think we should, for all the listeners out there, take it as a negative thing, simplicity. Yeah. It's it's clarity more so than simplicity where Dusty, his safe place, his comfort was on field with mm. a football in his hands. And anytime he would leave the club, I think that would be his uncomfortable place. Like just always from the start, even before he was a star. So we were his family. We were his safe place. We were the place where he could fully show who he was and be like applauded and celebrated for it. And he just dominated from day one and then um you can start to almost build a game plan around that type of player when they you know they're gonna and like before that Koch kind of led the way like you don't win a brown law off the back of just sort of putting about like he was super impactful from on an on and off field perspective with dusty yes um are they a bit of an odd couple from afar i, I don't I have no idea their personalities but just looking at them they look like an odd couple to me well it was like Koch is an old man in a young man's body. <laughs> like he is a super mature head. So he was like his dad. So Koch is, so Koch is 80, uh, Koch is born in 90 and Dusty's like maybe 92, 93 or something like that. Yes. He was his dad from like day one. Like wow. when Koch is like 22 and he took the, over the captaincy of the footy club, you're like, this guy's almost like too mature to be the captain of the footy club. Right. Like, so he was like father Kochin and, and, <laughs> and son Dusty. Uh, and it was a, a odd couple, but, I think they helped each other mature in different ways. 
Dusty taught Koch how to just loosen up a bit and just sort of see the world from a, I guess, a rogue's perspective. And I think Koch helped Dusty to see structure is required for survival. Hmm. That's interesting. It's good to hear. Somewhere through that period, 2015, that just doing a bit of research, it looked like there was an opportunity for you to come home. There was some Fremantle links. There was, you know, talk of you potentially, you know, you end up, you do end up hanging the boots up early um, compared to most. So but, didn't get the ass. <laughs> well, we don't know. We don't know. Like you say, you retired. Yeah. But 2015, like there's significant sort of press around you potentially returning home. Is that, I don't know, is that true? Yeah, so I met with Ross, um, Ross the boss, Ross the boss, because because you boys were stacked. You didn't need any backline help at that point, so it was it was fine. Well, fifteen, we just played in the grand final, yeah. and we down well, we glass. Went, well, Eric, class McKen- Eric McKenzie, all Australian, Schofield. Uh, Schofield. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> David Wurupunda. Was he still playing <laughs> no, at that point? Absolutely nah. not. David Wurupunda was one of my favourite players growing up. Outstanding. He's been he's back. He's been a back chat man. Um, outstanding player. So you. Mate, uh, you'd won your first of the three Golden Fists that year. You, mm. You're second All Australian, so you, I would say, peak career here. So, big deci- Well, so, I mean, 14, Starting. 15, 16, 17, it was, it was 18. trending. Well, correct, but it's a big moment. Mm. The crossroads you talked about before, yeah. sliding doors. So you met with Ross. How'd it go? Uh, and what were you thinking? It. Yeah, I, I loved it. I thought he was a great guy. Um, very like clear on what he wanted. Very clear on how I would fit in. Fremantle was starting to be successful at that point too, Absolutely, 2015. Yeah. What was the year they played in the granny? They played in the granny in 13, 13 but yeah. they they were hot. They were yeah. top two side. So it was a really big call for me, but the the thing that probably not a lot of people would have known at that point was it was at that, it was at 2015 where I started to contemplate finishing the game early um, because I was like complex being um mm. is this all there is like i've busted my tail since i was probably let's say 15 because that's when i really started to put some work into being a professional athlete and i had won a couple of all australians been sort of internally and externally recognized as a good player golden fist golden fist um got paid really good money and i was like is this it like is this what i like i've done what i thought would classify myself as being a successful player do i come home do i keep playing i was just really unclear as to what i wanted um and sometimes the best decision is to not make one and i'm glad that i didn't because um i think i probably ran away if i had have left i probably would have ran away from the actual reason why i was confused about what i wanted to do with my career so then continued on stayed part of the family stayed consistent and then that's what I guess led to my early retirement as I started to get more clarity over the next few years as to what I love about the game, what I don't love about the game and and why I wanted to hang it up. Keen to pick your brain on that a little bit, but if we just retrace it. So, okay, 15, you don't make the decision to come home. Richmond, um, you haven't won a grand final. You haven't looked like winning a grand final at this stage. 2016, you lose the last game of the year by over 100 points to Sydney. Um a lot of people speak about there being a bit of a turning point over that off-season. Do you recall that time? What happened? Talk me through it. Yeah. Um, That's a big loss. Yeah, massive loss. And I was so frustrated at the end of that game. I remember just – and it was probably the transition of my leadership a little bit too. I remember just like spraying guys that year. Were you like vice-captain? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, 17 was my first year as vice-captain. Right. And that's an interesting thing to talk about as well, like leadership and – because being a complex thinker, I wanted to lead the way I wanted to lead. I didn't want the structure of leadership meetings and the coach being able to crack down on me because you're a vice captain, you should be acting this way. I just wanted to do whatever I wanted to do in my time, which was kind of a mm. selfish way to look at being part of a team. Um, so yeah, it was at the end of that year that sort of Jack, Koch and myself independently did a bit of soul searching and were thinking like, you know, we can all probably continue on the way that we're playing individually and be Hall of Famers for the club or we can sacrifice a bit and try and win something as a group. So Jack had won a heap of All-Australians, I'd won a heap of All-Australians, Koch Brown, all that kind of stuff. Best and fairest, we'd all had a couple. I'd only had one because Dusty stole one by one vote, the dog. Um, <laughs> not that I'm sour about I, that. But like not even, it's a backman thing to be thinking like that as oh, well. Like midfielders yeah. award shock. Yeah. Um, he did win the Brownlow that year, but anyway. Um, so... <laughs> Um, 
it, it got to a point where, and I had a really good discussion with Ben Rutten about like, you can keep getting like 11 intercepts a game and we still lose, or you can get like eight to 10, put Dave, Grimesy, Nick Vloston, Basha Huli in the right spot, and they get one or two extras each, and we're net four above what you could do on your own. Mm. So that was, I think, a big turning point. And like, it's a big vulnerability piece to say. So I'm going to, you're saying I'm going to sacrifice my output at the potential of someone else improving. Like that's a bit of a risk for me. So I'm sacrificing my Wikipedia page for <laughs> for something I don't know. Yes. Um, but it worked out and it was the right call. So same. it sounds play, player-led. Like would you say it was player-led or was it a combination of what the coaches were doing as well? Oh, it was Dimmer and Koch. Like yeah. they, they both. So Dimmer was the same. Dimmer was like something's got to change. Um, he tried coaching every single way. Like because like we weren't – like we'd made finals in, uh, I think it was 13, 14, 15. So bundled out in the first round every time. Nice. Um, so we were okay, but never really a genuine contender. Yes. So yeah, end of 2016 was the, yeah, everyone sort of sat down. It was just like, what are we doing? Like we're the leaders of this organization. How are we going to get it better? There, and again, I only speak externally here, but I remember watching you blokes play, playing against you. And there was this, arrogance and this is before 2017 there was this I, I like i felt like i hated playing against you i hated playing richmond because i thought you were a bunch of wankers right and i know you weren't but it was like the on field you know this like bravado off the back of nothing and you could agree you could agree with that like nothing. you didn't have mm. you know i've been in teams exactly the same where you think you're good but you're not and that was mm. what i thought of richmond right and then you could you could literally see it again externally in 17 that that stopped. It it was like a it wasn't a humbleness, but it was it was almost like an acceptance of, you know, right, we we can be great together. Stop the bullshit, let's win. Mm. Like it, like I don't know if you experienced that internally, that's what it was, but there was there was such a clear I could I could see it from the other side of the country, mm. the change of mindset, maybe. I don't know. And I think there has to be a um like you can say, yeah, we need to be a selfless team, and like you know, the players have that powwow, you know, and as like old school, we'd everyone go to the pub and have a beer and go, you know, we just need to be more connected. So let's just get like pissed with each other more often. Like that was the old school, just yes. like you know, get connection, like yes. North Melbourne type of style. Um, <laughs> and but but then that only goes so far if you don't have a game plan or if you don't have coaches which are gonna say this is how you can be selfless. This is how you can be accepted for being selfless. So Camden McIntosh, we don't care how many stats you get as long as you patrol the perimeter and you make sure that no one gets on the outside of you. And anytime there's a switch kick ready to go, you're up the half forwards backside in between your wingmen. Like that's all you need to do. Jason Castagna, we don't care how many goals you kick as long as you bring the ball to ground if you're, out, if you're outnumbered in a contest and you hustle on the ground, that's all we care about. He kicked five points and two out in the fools in a grand final. Yes. Like, which, you know, he could have been Norm Smith medalist, but that just wasn't his skill set, you know? Like, <laughs> he was rewarded for bring the ball to ground and ch tackle and chase. Yes. So, you can have, like, selfless ideologies without a, a plan to go into, but we were very fortunate that we had both. But Dim was like, okay, this is how we're going to be selfless. And then we had a group that says, yes, we buy into this and we're going to do it. Do you look around, like, that period, 17, 18, 19, 20, you win three flags, losing a prelim in 18. Um... I don't think you were. I don't think you had the most talented twenty-two. Like there was teams during that period that was had significantly more talent than what you guys had. Do, do you? Would you accept that? Hundred percent. Yeah. And did that used to make you feel good about how you're playing and winning? That almost feel you make you feel better. Well, because we knew that like externally there was probably more more talent list, but internally we would choose no one else but the guys that we had. So it was like. Yeah, it wasn't really a, the acknowledgement of like, yeah, we know we're scrappers and we're, you know, we're just junkyard dogs that want to get it done. Like we actually had a quiet confidence about the fact that we all have strengths and skill sets. Like Camden McIntosh is like one of the greatest runners I've ever like seen go around a time trial and he's physical in the gym. Like, so celebrate that rather than like, you don't really get the ball that much. So, you know, we're going to not play you for that. Yes. Like. And he's just got really good awareness of sort of depth and space. And, you know, Jace Castagna, like competitive, really bouncy in the air. Like it's about acknowledging small strengths rather than the whole package. Like everyone tries to draft 
Like no one has enough first round draft picks to fill a team. Yes. Like, and even if you did, like a la GWS and Gold Coast, like it still might not even work. Yes. You need the glue. Yes. So last one on on this change, this period of change. Is there like it's sort of hard hard to sort of put a finger up? Is is there like a is there a moment like I remember Geelong being a Geelong fan growing up, Geelong boy. Uh, there was this there was this team meeting like this actual one time team meeting. Cam Mooney, Paul Chapman, Steve Johnson stood out the front and calling Gary Ablett out and we're gonna do this. Was there was there a that of anything? Was there a meeting that you Jack and Koch had together with Dimo? Was or was it was it a process? Like can you remember back to a significant like moment like right time to sort our shit out and start winning games of footy or is it a process um i think there was there was probably a couple of different moments that happened like really it was a perfect storm like on and off field because that was the time that the board wanted to overturn everything and, oh, and kick everyone out and yes. start again and and again like i said before sometimes the best decision is to not make one and just let the let the dust settle a bit um so off field that was happening which then made us realize like we've got a choice here is are we choosing unity or destruction like we can destroy everything and start again and then we're going to be put 5 years down the line and then Jack Koch and I are probably you know towards the twilight of our careers and really need to get a hustle on to win anything or we go let's stick with what we've got back in back in a slightly tweaked process and we can win something um so that was off field and then on field Dimmer and Koch brought the vulnerability piece in to be able to say this is who I am genuinely like put footballer aside. Like this is who I want you to appreciate me for is the guy off field who loves his family. Doesn't necessarily, and this is coach I'm talking about, like loves his family. Doesn't necessarily want to be staying after hours and playing table tennis and sliding through the change rooms and, you know, and, you know, playing Foursquare square and mucking about and going to the movies. Cause he had a, a young family. And so it's about going, Oh, okay. So it's not that you don't, want to spend extra time with us it's just when you're with us you're with us and then i want to go home and give my best to my family then so we started to appreciate everyone individually rather than saying everyone needs to be in in the club early and late to build connection it was like oh you still love us and but this is just the time that you've got for us yes so little moments like that at the start of that season helped be like okay cool i feel like i can compromise performance a little bit for connection uh, the club wins the premiership 2017. What's that? What's that day like? Can you rem- remember moments of that day? I remember moments of that week, but it just being like such a big, messy blur. Um, but specific moments of reinforcing what we'd established throughout the year of we've got a guy who's a devout Muslim. Um, we've got a guy who's, you know, Croatian. We've got Jehovah's Witness. We've got all these guys who uniquely have started to come out of their shell and say, this is who I actually really am. Um, and like that week looked so different for so many people. Like Basher, you know, when any time alcohol was involved, we made sure we protected Bash from that situation because obviously as part of his faith, that's not something that he wanted to be exposed to or mm. could be exposed to. Um, so... Specific moments, like I'll sort of probably bounce backwards and forwards a little stories, but um, at the end of the game, I remember going up to Bash and just going, whatever it is you want to do to celebrate this, because it's a pretty big milestone in anyone's career, don't feel pressured to do what everyone else is doing. If you don't want to go to the pub, if you don't want to be sprayed with beer, if you don't want to like, just tell tell me now and I, I can try and manipulate things so that you don't have to feel awkward about this. And he was like, thanks, man. No worries. And then- there's all these young young guys who are just wanting to just like sprint around. And then you've got Koch who Dan Rioli had like done something to his ankle. So he's on Koch's shoulders. Like we just had this really good sense of awareness of what people needed at what times. Was and Jack out? It was he singing with the killers this year? He would, he'd already booked that in like pre-game. Like this is a, this is embracing of the like personality types. So we're all in the in the change rooms after the game. We're like, how good's this? Like, yeah, yeah, where's Jack? He's out like silver gold jacket on. So like, at what point so he'd reached out to someone, some you know, a bit of pool somewhere, and he'd organize when we win this, yep. I'll be up with the killers. Yeah. Is that right? That's the swagger. That's the jacket. Did, you, swagger did anyone know that about that before the game? I did not have a clue. That's <laughs> a, how how amazing is that for like belief? That's just like, so we're gonna win, and not only are we gonna win, I'm gonna sing with the killers. Wow. 
Does he speak? Does he? Does he remind everyone of that, or does everyone remind him of that at all in reunions or anything like that? Or well, whenever we'd have like Mad Mondays or events, he would just put on Mr. Brightside, just like just as a subtle like cue it in the in the Spotify list, and he's like, just just give this one, <laughs> yeah, get off you, yeah. He's, uh, um, what about? Are you nervous pre-game or is because it because because uh, not even uh, you know grand final week, the training sessions, the parade, all of that, um, Adelaide. That season, who you played in that grand final had the power stance mm. that year. It was something Hilarious. I remembered. Hilarious. Hilarious. Really? Why? It was so. Is it hilarious pre, or was it like during, like during the anthem? You're thinking this is. I was smiling. I was like, "You guys look so dumb," and I could tell that they weren't comfortable doing it either. It was so forced, and so that was almost the contrast. And I feel like a lot of teams would have observed both in that grand final and thought i think we want to adopt more of the richmond than so adelaide put on a facade of strength and nothing will break us and we can do this we put on a mask of of of, um vulnerability which said it's okay if we make mistakes we're still going to get through it anyway Mm. and so there were like two really contrasting um, approaches to the same problem. If they had a one, maybe more teams would have tried that sort of stoic, nothing can break me. You know, even if, because I, I looked across and I could see there were some guys that were like, I am so dialed in right now. I'm the yellow Power Ranger and I'm ready to unite. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, but then there were some guys that I could just say like, can we just get this done? Can we just get this done? Get me out of here. I don't feel comfortable doing this stance. Like, can we just go? Like, so it's just like, you can't have a one size fits all thing yes. that, obviously then leads into other stuff which happened, which I won't go into after with Adelaide because I don't know the behind the scenes stuff, but it just seemed very forced. Mm. And But I wasn't nervous before the game, if you that's what you sort of asked. No, me. Yeah. yeah. And then what's the feeling like when the siren goes? Well, a lot of people ask me like, when did you know you'd won it? Yes. Um, and my answer has always been, I was surprised by the final siren. Like I was so dialed in and mm. so connected and we had this amazing bond as a backline where we just knew where each other were supposed to be. And it was like this like subconscious web that we always felt connected. I'm sure you'd been, you've played in those games where you just, you don't even have to speak and you're holding your guy down and some t- intercept marked over the top. Someone wraps around, handball receive, and you just have those passages of play. We're like, it's just better. like telepathic. Nothing better. Mm. And so that's what we felt sort of for the whole of the game. We were just so connected. Like, and it's okay. You make mistakes, but it's okay. We stay connected. And then it was like, oh, there's the siren. End of the game. What? We just won the grand final. How cool is that? Mm. Can you speak about that back line over, over that period? Mm. Talk talk some back line stuff to me. Like you're, you're speaking some my language with folks holding it down. I think people think watching that there's a lot of talk on the football field, which there is, of course. But in the very best moments, mm. there's nothing. It's yeah. just people doing things, right? Just in flow. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. With you mentioned before, Asprey. I, I don't think he gets enough credit to what he did with your back line mm. and Dylan Grimes. Yeah. Um, you know, there's 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 you mentioned them all, Brody, Flaston, like these guys, it's one of the great back lines, I think. Mm. It was great. Oh, it was the best for me. Mm. Like, you know, I, I would never I wouldn't have chosen anyone else. Like it there was, I was in a meeting this week with Dimmer and he was funny. He, we, we brought up Dave and he, they, he, he called Dave my comfort pony. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean by that? He's like, because you were such a emotional being that Dave was like your, mate, just chill. It's all good. Like things will be fine. And like, it makes sense. Like, cause Dave's very much in the mental performance space now and he's really level headed and calm. And he, I remember him just being just so chill. Like if I was starting to get a little bit red, like just a little bit too hot, he'd just be like, he'd like crack a gag or say something. And I'd just be like, oh yeah, that's all right. Like, calm I'm, yourself. Right? Yeah, so yeah. Just calm down. And then we've got guys like Basher who, you know, like Grimesy and I would always just be like, why doesn't he just like defend more? We just want him to defend. I'm like, mate, that's not his go. Like he gets 35 touches a game, breaks a line and draws attention to other parts of the game. Like I'm happy for us to play 5v6 if it means we get an offensive run out of him. Yes. So we started to get like better understanding of what each other needed. Grimesy, we called him um, Gramesy after a while because he's very black and white, could never live in the gray. So he just wanted to like, 
if we are in the fifth minute of the fourth quarter and we're 40 metres out from goal on a 45 degree angle and the weather is about 26 degrees with a slight head breeze coming from the north northeast, and we're kicking towards the Ponsford stand, where should I be standing? Yes, great. And you're just like, <laughs> what do you mean? What's the point of this conversation? Like, wow. it's never going to happen again. Wow. So it's like, like, Grimesy, live in the grey, bro. Like that's, it's, that's outstanding yeah. uh, nicknaming. 2017, you win it, uh, win it all. 2018, you arguably have a better year. You finish on top of the ladder. Um, again, it's like a like it pains me to talk about this, but the prelim final, Mason mm. Cox gets a hold of you, blokes, doesn't yeah. he? And I say you, blokes, because but it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate what you tried to do there, protect her back, but it was just me. It was a big game for the big Texan. Mm. I remember watching it because we were playing in the prelim the, the next night, so mm. you were on the Friday night. Uh, I remember watching, thinking, you know, fuck me. Like, what, what mm. is going on down there? What what was your thoughts being out there on the night? Um, or have you wiped it? No, I, don't worry. I have regular flashbacks of that game. But, like, but not all goals were on me. You know, that's correct. The, you know, absolutely not. <laughs> no, 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 no. A lot of, <laughs> three of the four were. Um, I just remember thinking that they just worked it out. And it just, it just so happened as well. Like, because I was, I think I was, always a bit talked about from an umpiring perspective about rule like because i would always try and like shunt players under the ball as like most defenders would like because yes. they always get the first reaction because they're responding to the kickers of the offensive team so you need to take something away whether it's like physically or and i wasn't like a super speed still where i could just like make it up so I got throughout the final series, there was a few sort of like free kicks that have been given away from me where I probably would have been more physical pre kick. So, like, do you want to talk some like technical defense? Stuff Absolutely. Or, righto. So, any defend, young defenders who are out there watching, uh, listen to the podcast. So, um, so, if you can imagine, like, so the distance from a kicker to the contest is like, say, 50 meters. And if you draw like an arc over the top of it, you should have already done your work halfway through the arc. Like, so the ball's halfway through its flight. You should already have the dominant drop zone position on your forward. Um, so I would usually be physical or whether it's, um, you know, taking some lead lane, however you want to do it, it's up to you. In that game, he was being really hard to control. And so then the kicks were a little bit flatter. And so instead of kicking these nice long loopy kicks where I could shunt him under and get it, they were just a little bit flatter and he was just taking them out right right in front and when you're six seven and can jump like i'm only six three and can't jump yes. so yeah like i'm not sure what i would have done differently maybe just done my work a little bit earlier um but it was just good tactics and just poor awareness by me that that <clears throat> that season they were doing that a bit they, they they'd open up that 30 20 meters in front of him and they'd kick it there before they even even moved it's interesting asking you about it because like we certainly learnt a lot as a backline. We watched that. We watched that a couple of quarters specifically because we played him in the grand final. Tom Barras ended up playing on him and, mm. and played him differently than you did. And it's like it's perfect backman chat we're talking about here. But TB played him almost on a front shoulder, which mm. TB's back shoulder almost ninety percent of the time. Yeah, I remember watching him play. He played very well. Put him at front shoulder because he, he wasn't asking for it out the back ever. Mm. You know, it was one of those guys. But they, they, they. They they tactically did some great things that year, Collingwood. Mm. Um, talking about watching vision, that, that that game specifically, I, I I hear it a bit from over east that the Richmond were the best side that year, and you blokes were lucky to win the grand final in eighteen. And in seventeen, uh, no, in eighteen. So you blokes were the best team, oh. and we West. Oh, Coast, you were, were lucky, lucky to win. To win oh, so that's a bit of a whack. Yeah, I think so. Um, given we beat you during the season, uh, the only time <laughs> we played you, and then. I think you got to get it done in a prelim, right? And, and you blokes didn't. We, on the Monday, grand final week, watched your first 20 minutes of that game and watched it in silence. Adam Simpson didn't speak. He said, just watch this, boys. We watched it. And then at the end of it, he said, what, what did you notice? And it was noticeable that you blokes didn't rock up in the, in the first 20 minutes of the first quarter. And whether that's whatever that reason is, given how – Great, this team was right. You blokes win three grand finals in four years. Uh, at some point of me telling this story is thank you because it was a, <laughs> it was well it was a, it was a watching of boys we're playing in grand final this week. Mm -hmm. You need to fucking rock up. Doesn't matter how good you are. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you beat the team the week before. Doesn't matter what you've done. It's 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 in the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and you blokes, you know that's you can't deny that, right? Mm -hmm. 
prelims and grand finals are nil all. Like history means nothing. They're yep. completely different games. Um, I think, yeah, like I always love chatting about momentum and what does momentum mean in the game of AFL, in the game of sport in general and, and how does it get arrested? How does it begin? And when you say you don't rock carp, I don't agree with that statement because we always rocked up to perform. Yeah. We always we performed, we prepared exactly the same way. Yes. We probably just weren't prepared for the momentum that was coming that quick. Yeah. And then you're just like, whoa, like Onslaught. Whoa. Yeah. So then you're already on the back foot. And we probably weren't um mature enough or prepared enough for that to be able to go, okay, like this is very early in the game for us to be feeling this way. How do we and so because I remember that game like I think Dave was a bit sore. I played poorly. Dusty wasn't really seen that much. And so it was like three pretty big cogs that weren't really in yes, sync. Yes. Um, so that's – and that's why I'm really passionate about the mental performance space as well. It's about like how can you spend as little time in that shock space or like B game or whatever you want to call it space and just quickly flick yourself back to instead of it being – six goal lead it's just a three or four yes and then you're still in the fight yes whereas we were all we were just always clawing back from there and it just i remember just thinking halfway through the game like i just want this to end like yeah. i just this is this is not good brutal <laughs> yeah oh, it's a brutal feeling and and you do your acl first game the next year yeah so that's your last final you play at afl level yeah does that do you think about that yeah like i think you you always have an opportunity to learn from every single instance. So, you know, if we hadn't lost the prelim in 2018, so say we won the grand final in, or we even just made the grand final in 2018, would we have drunk our own bathwater and then not gone on to have the Drive. sort of dynasty? Mm. We lose that one, you win 1920. Um, you know, I, I look at that, I look at that moment, um, and I remember in the off season thinking like, I never want to feel that way again. Like I just want to, I had the most amazing off season. Like I was fitter than I'd ever been. Um, and not, I don't think anyone knows this about my knee. And I said, actually the first time I've sort of said it publicly, but um, I actually think I did my knee before that game by accident. So I was kicking the footy down the park um, with my dad and my dog was running around and um yeah, we we're down at our, our beach house in Port Arlington, and, and um, I remember kicking the footy with him and just doing some extras and stuff like that. And I kicked, and when I was in the air, my foot was extended like that. This other dog that was chasing my dog smashed into the side of my knee, and I was like, "Ah, this really hurts. This is a thing that I've never really felt before. This pain in my knee." And so I iced it, and I was like, "Oh, I think it should be okay." So anyway, I just kept running, and I think it might have been a partial tear then. Wow! And then it uh, the, just sort of I don't know. I, you never know, but. I sort of kept going with preseason and then obviously did it in round one. But um, so that's a that's a breaking news story. Welcome to back chat, everybody. Yeah, welcome to back chat. Uh, Mitch Brown did the same thing. Uh, Mitch Brown ACL and partially tore it. It was in the same game. He had yeah. an incident in the first quarter, yeah. and he speaks the same as you. He'll never know. Yeah. He said there was a little incident similar. Someone came across him, and he was like, it's "Hang weird. on a second, yeah. that feels weird." And mm. you had a bit of time. Like when when was this dog incident? In the um, summer, like this was this was like weeks before, right? So yeah, it was it. It may or may not have been, no, but like I don't, I don't know how long you can actually train on a partially torn ACL before it actually. They didn't. They didn't used to operate on. They yeah. used to. They used to just, just let him go. Yeah, let him go. <laughs> strap him up. Don't turn. Look. Don't turn right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just you turn. So what's that? What's that feeling like though? You do your ACL mm. regardless of if it was a dog or if how you did mm. it. I, do you know at the time ACL done? And is it is no it sadness? It, is it what it was? It? Because that was the weird feeling. Like, so when I, like, the dog hit me, I was like, wow, this is like this ache in the middle of my knee. And I've never sort of felt that before. Whatever. Iced it up, carried on, did preseason, round one, bang, did it again. I'm like, I did, it didn't dawn on me then, but I'm like, I, I just thought, wow, this is an uncomfortable feeling again. It'll be okay. I'll come off, ice it, and it's probably just like a bruise of some sort. Right. And then, like, the doc comes in and he's just like doing the rocking thing. And he's just like, doesn't look good, mate. Did he tell you? Yeah. He's like, but he doesn't say like straight up you've blown it out, but he's like, "That's the test." The, yeah, the, the rocking of that. Yeah, he's like, "It's pretty loose." So and so I knew by, before the end of the game that it was pretty much done. Right. So I had a bit of time to think about the person that I wanted to be 
when I resurfaced. Like I could be kicking the dog and I could – pardon the pun. I should have kicked the dog the first time, the stinking mutt. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I could have walked out and just been kicking the dog and just been really flat and sort of you know, self-focused. But I've seen the photos. You were, you, were, you were not happy, I'm assuming, but you were, you were smiling. You were hugging yeah. your mates. Yeah, we won the game and um, I didn't want it to be about me and um, – I wanted them to – everything that we'd done in 2017, 2018 was always about us rather than individual. So I didn't – I always wanted to believe that it, it, like it wasn't because of me that we've gotten to the point we have. So it'll be okay. Like everything will be fine. Like I'm replaceable, um, which it turned out to be true. 2019 won the flag by heaps, so it was fine. Um, but it took a lot of like gathering myself and faking it till I made it to sort of just be like everything will be okay, everything will be okay. Yeah. Um, because I hear that about, you know, it's all about us and, and, and I I can hear it's real. I don't think you're lying. But, I, you know, having been in footy environments and been in that, that in team environments like that, there, there, ha- there has to have been a woe is me that feeling. I, I, like, that, there has to have been. Because it, it's, 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 it's human nature. To- mm. I think part of me probably didn't even didn't want to believe it yet yeah, like right. that I'd probably done it and so I'm like yeah no worries I've I've beaten the odds before like um I'll be fine yes. and I was like Tyson Goldsack came back in 6 months I can come back in 6 months um so that was my goal and I was just training like harder than I'd ever trained to get back to playing the grand final because I knew we were going to I knew I didn't know we were going to win it but I knew we were going to be very very good so I said from the very start, I was like, guys, I'm I'm training to come back and play. Like this isn't a thing that I'm just going to, you know, 12 months and we'll put you on ice for 2020 because it was already at that time that I was sort of thinking about this is probably going to be my last year anyway, regardless right. of whether I do my knee or not. Right. But it was almost like the knee gave me the opportunity to really solidify in my mind that I don't need another one. Like I don't need another flag. I don't need to prove anything else. I just need to live my life a different way did you get close to playing did you get close to coming back i reckon i could have played in the grand final is that right mm, yeah but like so the, the chat with dimmer was so I, I came up to him and i'd done all my like triple crossovers and all that kind of stuff and I'd, I'd started training back and i had the chat with dimmer um and i was like i want to play he's like is this went prelim Grand final week? Uh, I week? think this was the start of the finals. Like so, so in the finals mix. And so I'd already started to talk to them about the fact that like, I'll, I'll sort of preface it this way. So yeah, I want to play. And he's like, look, we've, we've got this far without you. What if you were to break down in the middle of a game and we lose? Like, how would you feel about that? Like, you know, and then it's kind of, do you feel, um, you know, bad about that? So I was like, yeah, actually, I probably would. Like, he's like, yeah, because anyway, like next year we're going to be loaded up, ready to go. Like, you'll be fine, it'll be 100 fit, and we'll just we'll just do it again next year. And I'm like, there's kind of not a next year. Do you tell him that? Yeah, and it was just kind of like, I think because most of the year it was, oh yeah, I was like, hey guys, I'm just having these thoughts. Like, but it was at that point I was like, there is no next year for me, right? And he was just like, imagine that as a coach, Absolutely. like going That's into a final, I was like. I've got to deal with all this crap. And then one of my best players is coming to me saying he wants to retire. Just like, I just can't deal with this right now. Right. So it was like, it was a pretty heavy time. And um, yeah, I, I remember talking to the group about the fact that like I wanted to play, but I would prefer to not put the team success at risk, which in some hindsight is a bit of a wanky thing to do. But like, <laughs> I think I needed it for my own closure just to be like, hey guys, this is how I'm feeling. I really wanted to play, but I don't want to play because just in case I break down, I don't want to cost you guys. So it's like, you know, pat yourself on the back. Do you Alex, stand up I... in front of the group and say that? Mm, yeah. That was, was that at all emotional? Super emotional for me. I, yeah, I cried. Bloody like, I was. I can imagine it'd be unbelievable. Yeah, it was tough. Um, but that's the kind of group we had. Like we were just vulnerable and open and cared about each other and just wanted to tell everyone how I was feeling. And you, and you, and you're effectively retiring in that same speech. Are you effectively saying, I'm not going to put my hand up to play and, and I'm done in my mind. Yes. But like it was until the end of the, so I sort of still gave myself like, so after that we won the granny, the coaches just came and said, look, just give yourself the break, freshen up, come back, do a bit of preseason and then let us know. Um, so then it was, yeah, it was the end of, so it was the end of the start of the Christmas break and then I sort of said, yeah, this is, nothing's changed. I'm, I'm good to go. Was it hard to watch that 
grand final win or not? 2019? Yep. It was, yeah. Like, but it, just in a weird way because I think that was like, this is the last game I'm going to be in this experience. Like I'm going to be in the arena as a player, even though I'm not playing. And I think that was the part that was a bit emotional for me. Um, and I remember like seeing Brett Deledio after the game as well. So he'd playing for the Giants. Yeah. So uh, no. So he. No. Sorry. 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 I, this was that was a different memory. That's when he was in the prelim against GWS in 2017. That's right. Um, but just feeling like the similar sense of emotion, just like man, I'm not going to be back here again. This is weird. Um, and it wasn't that I wasn't happy for the boys that were playing. I was just like, this is a pretty big moment for me too. Um. So yeah, I tried to almost distance myself from the boys when they were celebrating after that because I'm like, I don't know, just a protective mechanism just to not, yeah, not feel too much on the day. But well, yeah. And also not make it about you. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then they were really great. Like they sort of you know, got me in and I've got plenty of awesome photos from that day with Grimesy and Dave in the confetti and stuff. And uh, you I do actually have a funny story if you want to lighten the mood a bit. Absolutely. All right. So throughout that year, because um, I'm always a complex thinker, um, so I wanted to do more than just train and I, I like, like re rehab my knee. So I said to Craig McRae, who was coaching our VFL side at the time, I really want to help you guys out. So what can I do? And he's like, yeah, you can sort of help with the backline stuff and sort of just do some leadership general stuff. Gee, you were stacked at assistant coaches. <laughs> yeah. Craig McRae, no worries. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Craig McRae, we had um, Adam Kingsley, who yes. went on to be- Rutten. Yeah, Rutten. Head coach. So we, Loaded up. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, he said, no worries. That'd be great if you could just help us out. So the VFL side went on to win the grand final that year in the in the VFL against Williamstown at Vizzy Park, which was like such a cool game to be a part of. It was like last, like two minutes I of the game. This one. Willy Wheeler was like, you know, for Williamstown. Willy Willy for Williamstown. Say that with a mouthful of chips. <laughs> um, so he was playing really well and like we, we just won. So I sort of, pulled rank as a leader and sort of said, hey, boys, like the players know who are sitting out that are probably going to play. So like Marlon and Camden and some of these other guys. So everyone else, like it's it's on. Like we've just won a grand final. Like celebrate. But yes. like it's it's locked in at the club. Don't go out anywhere. If you go out anywhere, I'll be really disappointed. And like you're on your own. I, I won't cover any grenades no, no for protection. you there. Great. Um, but – Lock in at the club. I'll organize some beers upstairs. We'll just have like a, we've got the cup. We'll just really enjoy it because you don't win flags every day. Right. Um, so, but please don't leave the club. So anyway, <laughs> we've gone back to the club. Fly was there. Everyone was there. We're having the greatest time, like just laughing, carrying on, drinking some beers. Cup was there. Just really, really good time. Got to about 12.30. And so this is on a Sunday, I think. So then, yeah, it was on a Sunday. So Monday is the first day of grand final week for yes. the AFL side. Um, so I also said, boys, just like, I don't care what state you're in Monday, just be there. Like, be there and just, if you're drunk, shut up and don't say anything, just be there. So in hindsight, I wish I had been a bit more clear. So <laughs> so, so Sunday, I'm like 12.30, I'm like, that's probably me. Like, being a vice captain, I probably should be there in a reasonable state on Monday to be able to part of the leadership group meeting and all that kind of stuff. So boys, 12.30, I'm out. Remember the rules. Don't leave this place. Get home at a reasonable hour and just be here for Monday to support the team to win the AFL Great. grand final. Understood. Leave. Thanks, Francie. Have a great night. Leave. Yeah, Let's... perfect. Yep, got it covered. So leave, <laughs> come back um, Monday, just like, oh, you beauty. And so Dimmer has this face of a thunderstorm in the I'll morning. I'll see it. And I'll I was just it. like, I was like, what's happened? I'm like, I don't know what's happened. And so anyway... <laughs> He's apparently rocked in and there is corpses everywhere. There's bodies on the yoga mat. There's someone sleeping on the yoga mat. There's someone sleeping in the basketball court. There's just like, like from the night before, yeah. blokes have done what I've told them to and saying, not leave. What's the problem? But they didn't stop drinking until like 10 minutes before the coach came. Yeah. And someone's like- well, did have, they follow, have they followed direction from a senior leader? Yes. But, yes, they did. D they did not leave. Perfect. They are there on Monday to support the AFL team. Come are they on. awake? Did you tell me they're being awake? No. Wasn't clear enough. Apparently Dimmer reckons that like, so Callum Coleman Jones who went to North Melbourne was like just walking out as Dimmer was walking into the club because he always got there early at like 6 a.m. And so he's like, oh, wow, Cal, good on you, mate. Like putting in the extra yards, like getting there early. No, no, he's just finishing. He's just finishing. He's not just starting. And so like that was so, so Dimmer's like, I've, I've walked into Dimmer's office. Steaming. I'm like, oh, I'm like, 
and I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room. I just wanted all the elephants in the room. Uh, I just want to let you know that like I said that. He's like, you effing idiot. Like he's like, I was going to play Callum Coleman Jones in the grand final. I was no. like, in my, in my mind, I'm like, no, you won't. Yeah, he's barely played a good game this year. Like, yeah, <laughs> so I was like, um, so anyway, like I sort of weathered, so I'm just copped it. Just, just, you sort of cop all the verbal punches and you're just like, yep, 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 yep. Okay, okay, can I just leave now? So anyway, didn't affect anything. Training was as usual. A few boys, like, I think Brandon Ellis actually told me that, like Jake Arts was like shotgunning a beer in the warm up of like the, <laughs> the Monday morning session. Anyway, so um, like, because I just didn't want it to look like um, Richmond have won the VFL. They're like head wobbling. They think it's like a, a done deal. They're going to win the AFL. So, yes. and, and neither did Dimmer. Yeah. Dimmer, Dimmer's cut them from the same cloth as Simo. They've been on a Clarkson. I, I know that I've, I've been in this meeting. I've been in this meeting. Trust me. So it was like, so anyway, went through, all good, swept under the rug after the grand final. So grand final siren goes, walk up to him and I'm like, hey, what about Monday morning? How funny was that? And he's still just like, too soon. <laughs> 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 we just won the flag, Dimmer. Loosen up. Too soon. Did anyone find it? No one found out about this. No, nah, not really. That's unreal. No. Nah. Couldn't love that anymore. Yeah. Oh, it couldn't agree. Like, like no, you don't win a premiership every year. And, and there's this constant balance in AFL teams with a waffle side or sorry, a VFL side, whatever. Yeah. You know, making sure there's team success. You just want a flag. Yeah. I think brilliant leadership by you, Alex Rance. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, thank you. That's a great story as well. I want to finish on this. You finish your career early. It's a you know undeniable fact that you retire before most would, and um, you weren't delisted like me and your dad. Uh, <laughs> you, hung, you, hung, you hung the boots up, uh, and I and I've seen you talk about this before, but keen to know why. Like how, how does that you know? And we have spoken about it a little bit. I think I can kind of get there with the way you think about things. But why do you retire at the end of twenty nineteen? Let me like the reason why I was bad at the start of my career. Uh, was identity crisis. The reason why I retired at the end of my career was consolidation and confirmation of I know who I am now and I know who I want to be. So the player that I became on field was this combative physical beast um, that was a win at all costs type of person and and sometimes even you know rubbed even my teammates the wrong way because I was so competitive and wanted to win at, at everything and not lose any contests. I think that's what made me a good player. Then off field... I was this jokey, connected, caring, empathetic, supportive, have time for everyone type of person. Like that was Jekyll and Hyde in the same body. Like how can you have this like almost white line fever person and then on and off field and then sometimes do they blend and cross over? Like because if you become this empathetic, caring, supportive person on field, you'll just get dominated, yes. as a, especially as a defender. Yes. Imagine if you just walked up to Buddy Franklin and just be like, mate, I just really love the way you play. I like, sometimes thought about doing that because he didn't like lip. As in, if you said, I'm going to dominate you, but oh, I'm, you know, if you started getting into Buddy, yeah. you don't do that to Buddy because he would go, no worries, mate, I'll kick 10 on you. Poke I always bear. thought about actually going, Buddy, mate, I hope you have a brilliant day, day today. Your boots look great, mate. Yeah. I hope the family's in the crowd clapping you on. <laughs> so I know the example, though. It's a good example. So, but then also, like, imagine you go the other way. Like, so my three cues when I was playing were proactive, physical, and dominant someone cuts me off or someone pushes in front of me at Coles, imagine if I'm physical, dominant, proactive in that situation. Like, I did, and I just started to get to the point where there was some, there was a few occasions where some of the stuff did blend where, not that I was ever like physical, clocking people. Physical, yeah, dominant. like, you know, at the dog park, someone like, you know. Get your dog away from me. I've already what? done the ACL once. <laughs> it's off. Yeah. Shunting them under the ball yeah. and pushing them out of the park. Um, spoiling that tennis ball out of the, out of the park. Um, True backmanship. Yeah, Terrible. yeah, golden, golden fist. Do you know who I am? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so it was just really blaringly obvious to me that I want to be this person. I don't want to be this person anymore. And I've, I've, I feel like I had to pay this price to be this person. So to be this dominant, physical, proactive, win-at-all-cost competitor, I had to pay that price, even though it hurt me, to be this loving, caring, empathetic person off-field. And so I got to the point where I was like, I'm not willing to pay that price anymore. Mm. And I want to, because that, that person came from my family and my faith. Like, so that empathetic, caring, considerate, um, funny, engaging person came from my upbringing, came from my love of the Bible and knowing where I come from and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it was just a pretty um, straightforward answer 
for me just to say, okay, well then you need to cut this off. But it still came with hurt because it was a, you know, you lose, lose a whole group of friends. You've been open about your religion, your faith. Um, I think probably more so than anyone really in the AFL. We don't, we don't hear about people's belief systems too much. You know, Basha Hooli, of, I don't know, not of course, but I feel like that was more in the open, but you, you've certainly spoken about it and, and I've heard you speak about that being a big reason why you end up stepping away. Like, can you know, add context to that, I suppose? Yeah, I think um, like when you look at um, the way people want to live their lives is, you know, to a standard. So you've got consistency, like – people gravitate more towards people that they know are going to be consistent. Like even if they are a little bit outspoken or a bit abrasive, at least that's, I know what I'm going to get, but I get everything else that's good about them with that. Or so everyone searches for like a common moral code or like something that gives them consistency and structure and stability. Um, And so for me as a kid, like I was always like, I went to sort of church as Jehovah's Witness and I was aware of the Bible and stuff like that, but it was never really like, yeah, this is the way that I want to live my life. I was like, yeah, that's nice. There's some good good stories and some um, good thoughts. Um, but it wasn't until I realized that I needed that to sort of more build a framework around the way that I want to live my life. So um, I looked at other, you know, religions because I believe that the Bible was, it, it couldn't be made up. Like it, it's, I've done some research and proved it to myself that it was it was true and accurate. And so I was like, who's, studying the Bible the best or who who has the best sort of view on the Bible and then sort of came back to Jehovah's Witnesses and um, they really helped me to, um, yeah, align what I thought my personal values were with what the Bible says and work out where are the differences and where are the commonalities and start to live a life that was probably more in line with Bible standards than, than not. So, um, yeah, I think... Religion can be a bit of a divisive topic at times, but like I'm more than open to talk about it. And I think yeah. that it just needs to be coming from a place, not of judgment of like, um, I'm judging you because you live this lifestyle because, um, yeah, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to judge me. So why am I judging anyone else? And if I believe that God created everyone, he's the one that does the judging at the end of the day. Mm. So um, it was more about just aligning my life more with Bible principles and um, doing the best that I can to, um, yeah, build a stronger relationship with God. To put a nice bow on it all, it sort of feels like your career through Richmond um, and then the ability to the team to accept people for who they are, like it ties back into the really the religious element you just spoke about, but who you are as a person and who others are as well. And that's what actually created your success in the end. Yeah, it's. I've never really looked at it. I've never really looked at it that way, but it is a pretty nice summation that like I'm I'm forever grateful for the journey that I've had with Richmond because it it gave me that confirmation that it is okay to to be me and have this this code of 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 living which you don't need to be all things to all people, um, which I thought I needed to be as an 18 to 22 year old. I need to be this complete competitor, really funny and really like witty and and go on the footy show and do all these things like. When really sometimes it's like it's what you say no to that makes you more authentic as a human. Mm. That's an interesting thought, given that you've hung up the boots after a lot of all Australians, a premiership player, uh, done and dusted. You haven't finished at AFL level though. Gold Coast, just quickly, that's what you're doing now. You're working in the mental performance space there. You've reunited with Dimmer. I want you to speak a little bit about what you're doing there and, and how you see that team. But before... Uh, the photo that came out last year of you in a Gold Coast jumper in the marketing department at Gold Coast, were they were they just going, let's just tempt everybody a little bit. We've made the Alex Trans appointment. Maybe we just scare everyone to believe in that you may be making a comeback at the age of 34 years old. <laughs> it's so funny. Like, And you would know the um, commercial ops versus footy ops. Yes dilemma which yes. always exists so um I, I, i'll just say i saw the photo and i thought fuck me alex Rance is playing for fucking gold coast this year <laughs> and i was like holy shit this is amazing <laughs> and then the commercial marketing brain came in and i thought perhaps the new sponsor that that was released for didn't have a polo attached to it and maybe the jump was the only thing lying around where was it 
Correct. So, <laughs> so Loop Logics is um, a construction management software company that my brother and Laura and I are, are in, um, and so um, we sponsor the uh, neckline of the of the Suns. And so, yeah, we didn't have a polo that was printed up, but also we were like, this is probably going to get some clicks. So, um, yeah, the commercial department were like this is awesome. And they're like, it's, I think it is actually the most viewed article that the sons have ever had. Um, but Amazing. the footy department were like, you do that again, you're out. <laughs> so it's this constant, like, because I, I do all this work for loop logics, the, the tech company, but I'm also employed by the Suns, So I'm like trying to tread this fine line of what's commercially a really good opportunity, but also I don't want to compromise my standing with the players in the footy department. So it's like, yeah, it was awkward actually on, Thursday, the team photos were there and Loop are a sponsor. So we're in team photos and like, Rancy, how are you? <laughs> yep, you're in Loop stuff now. What's going on? That's very good. I like that. So, how do you see the Gold Coast Suns? They've been, um, you know, they're your employers. So I don't expect you to, you know, give, I know there's some restrictions around what you can say here, but they've been, from my opinion, you know, they, they, uh, a club that's come into the competition, they haven't had a lot of success. So, this group now, how do you see them? Is there comparisons you can draw to Richmond in terms of how it's aligned and clearly with Dimmer at the helm now? Um, I think it's always hard to draw comparisons because every club is unique and I don't, I wasn't around when Dewey was coaching and all that kind of stuff. All I can speak for is Dimmer's consistency of, of principal coaching. The fact that there's a framework which he's, giving give he gave us at richmond and he's now given um the sons about how best to approach the game at the end of the day the players are the ones that need to make the call in the moment they're the man in the arena they're the ones that need to make the call in that moment so that's where i think my role links in is is giving the players the confidence that you have the right to make the call and dim is not going to whack you for making a wrong one he's just going to say that's a good bit of data Next time, let's learn from it and try and make a better one because it's a long season. So I think just the belief factor, The um, when I came there, I was so amazed and impressed at the culture and connection they had off field. They're really, really good connection. You'd have to be, you know, it's, you're by yourself in the Gold Coast, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and so they're, they're such a good bunch of blokes, like really good. And I, I think it'd be rare to find a footy club that you're like, man, correct. these guys suck. But yeah, um, but they're, they're really well connected off field. And it's just about then translating what does team success on a consistent basis look like? And how can I sort of connect the gap between, yes, this is coach philosophy and coach speak to I've lived it and I've been a player and that's all right. You can sort of flirt with the boundaries here and this and that. So like Do you see your new and refreshed Dima after he's can take you to, uh, um, <laughs> through Europe? I haven't brought that up with him, was, but I feel I'll like- I'll tell you what, he was, just, he was tanned. Yeah. Very good. He's very, yeah, very tanned, often like some Italian sort of <laughs> island somewhere or Greek island. I don't know. Yes. But he's a very scary man to joke with. Like, yeah. Can imagine some, that. He could like, he's like Cyclops from X-Men. He can just like bore a hole in you with his eyes sometimes. And just like, I'm sorry, I just want to go. So yeah, I'm probably not going to joke around with him. <laughs> very good. Until later. Well played. Uh, I've gone too long. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. We're not quite done. You and I are going to go and play with each other on a football field. Uh, <laughs> uh, the WA All Stars game coming up. Um, how are you in good nick? Because I'm not. I'll happily say I'm not in good nick. And I'll yeah, but like you were like a Olympic 400 meter runner, so you're like your bad nick is like a three minute one k. So. I'm not in terrific nick. I will say that. Are you? Are you going to be lining up on Pav? Who's taking? I don't think Pav's played since he retired. So this is his first game back. Well, this is isn't it, we spoke about this before that like no one wants to play as a defender when they come back no, and play no, like absolutely. which. Not, not on one of the greats the game's ever seen. No. So I feel like I have to for the you're sake the of the captain. spectacle. You're the captain. But there will be a large portion of the time that I'll be floating forward. I won't be coming across taking intercept marks. I can tell you, you're one-on-one. <laughs> -on -one, I'm leaving you to get your business done. Mate. <laughs> uh, mate, it's been a pleasure. A little brief uh, social media, not social, social. I'll, leave, I'll just sit that with you just while we get into it. This is from the people for you. You've heard enough from me. There's some questions from the people. We're getting straight into Corey Barden. You can answer these as long as short as you like. You probably need to get to the game, so keep them short. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's all right, 3.30 arrival time. <laughs> Have you taken Buddy off your leash yet, says Corey. Yes, I love that comment. That's great. <laughs> um, Buddy and I, I, I loved playing on Buddy because he was kind of like the pinnacle of like the player of the time. Like yes. Everyone needed that scalp to be even considered for All-Australian. If Buddy kicked more than four goals in you in a game, you're out. 
Like you're not even making the squad. Wow. So every game I came up against him, I was like, I need to need to go well here. But um, yeah, depending Over on how the much journey. But if there was a tail of the tape, Rance or well, Rance. so the, I reckon I reckon it's all square. But there's one game which I should have taken. So I reckon I was best on ground up to three quarter time because when he was playing for Sydney at the G, and he got, comes out and kicks three in the last quarter, and I'm just like, really? So we split the points. Yes, but I've. I've for seventy five percent of the time, no one remembers the seventy five percent. No, you they know don't. That. You know this that. is the plight of back chat. This is the plight of a backman. It's they bullshit. Can get all these goosey goals in the junk time, and all of a sudden it comes back on us. We do all the hard work, Correct. and then these flipping flogs. Yep. absolute flogs. Uh, Dubster asks, "What memories do you have, uh, and how important to you was the Fife's Flyers? You're an inaugural member of." Uh, Fifey's team. I loved that. That was so fun. Rocking into my skateboard and like the, <laughs> yeah, right. um, that was it was such a fun game. Really cool. I, I wish the AFL had to put more time into that. But stacked team: Pendlebury, Bonton, Pally, Josh Kennedy, Josh Kennedy. It, it was Sydney, yeah. absolutely stacked. Yeah, of players. Laird, Rory Laird was in it. Yeah, uh, Should have won. Jack's team. Oh, feels um, like. all right, we're gonna keep moving. Chinton eighty four says, "Does he still catch Pokemon?" Yes. So I was actually just in Japan. Uh, so uh, looking for Pokemon. Well. A little bit of that, but more so like Pokemon cards. You know, some Pokemon cards go for like thousands of dollars now. So for anyone who's got Pokemon cards sitting in their closet from childhood, get them out, get them graded, get them sold. Really? Yep. So we, did you find any thousand dollar ones over there? Catch them all. <laughs> Caught them all. Caught them all. Uh, I just need a name here. Don't need it. We've got a story there. Duck John, who was the best off ground during the premierships. And, and he adds, as an outsider looking in, I'd say Baker. <laughs> no, he. Amazing West Australian as well, uh, Lake Grace area. Um, that's a very rich uh, area Fifey, for Fifey, was... Fifey, the Mortons. Wow. Um, Kyle yeah. and Mitch. Yep. And Jared. And Jared. Um, off field. Now, do you know who the best was? And not just from like a party boy perspective, because you could definitely drink this fella, but he was a very good facilitator of events. Sean Grigg. Amazing. So he basically got every single pub in the Richmond area to put a tab on for us anytime we wanted to go. So we just rock up to any Richmond pub, and there's a lot of pubs in Richmond. Yes. And just get our, you know, two or three hours of free pots, go to the next one. Wow. Grigger, I like that a lot. He's coaching the Gold Coast Suns now. He is. Very good. Coach. So is there Gold Coast Suns pubs around? Maybe that's. <laughs> They're very spread out, though. So. Yeah, correct. You got to drive between them. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just sorry. I'm ready to. Uh, what arm workouts do you do to get those pipes looking like that? <laughs> like you used to oil up. You used to lather up. No, nah, just, I'm just very sweaty. You didn't used to lather up? High salt, high volume sweater. You didn't Cramps. use to oil? No. Nah. You never oiled? No, nah, that's because I struggled to catch the prune. Imagine that. Did you have Straight someone through. lathering you? No. Okay. I just thought you were a latherer. That's all. Cuzzy was the king latherer, yeah, wasn't he? You played you play with Cuzzy. Grease me up, woman. <laughs> just standing up, get the duck fat out. Away you go. <laughs> oh, that's very good. I'm going to finish with this one from the Eggman. How do you like your eggs, Alex Rance? How do I like my eggs? Scrambled. Scrambled. Very good. That's yep. us done and dusted. A big thank you to you, mate. Did you have fun? Best. Very good. Best. I thought so. Uh, hello at backchatpodcast.com.au. Um, you can find all of our stuff at backchatstudios.com.au. A big thanks to Fleet Network for driving the podcast this year, Margaret River Roasting Co., uh, Shelter Brewing Co., Leadable cameras. Sign up as a Patreon for one more uh, short story from Alex Rance. That's been back chat, my friend. Thank you very much. Good fun. Who would have thought we could spend an hour and a half just talking back chat? <laughs>